Hello, this is your host, Todd Lewis. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe and hit the notification bell. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Telegram. And don't forget to support me on Locals, Buy Me a Coffee, and Subscribestar. Today's episode is going to be a little bit shorter, in part because of the holiday season. We're going to go for about two hours. Of course, uh, we'll engage with the chat at the end, and we'll read supers first. So if you want to make sure we get to what you want us to see, go ahead and send us a super. And I'm again, well, I'm again joined by Logos. So we're we're grinding through Moldbug, and it's uh, all I'll have to say is uh, to quote Henry V, "Once more under the breach, dear friends, once more." That's what it feels like, Henry V. Shakespeare's Henry V. So today we are looking at "Be Infinitely Devoted to Your Beloved Owners," Mencius Moldbug, August thirteenth, two thousand and seven. If we want to understand the Western world today, we have to start by understanding the mid-20th century Germans and the Soviet Union. Comparing the modern New Deal state to NS and communism is like comparing a human chimp to a gorilla, or like comparing a bank robber to a murderer and a rapist. It's easy to find both categorical similarities and categorical differences. It's also easy to abuse the analogy for polemical purposes, a trope I find utterly boring, but at its best, as in the work of Wolfgang Schwivenbusch, it reminds us why we have history at all. Fascism, universalism, and Marxist Leninism were the three movements that fought for global dominance in the 20th century. All three developed from the 19th century tradition of nationalist democracy. All three would have been struck almost any 18th century writer as tyrannous and abominable, but that doesn't mean we don't have to choose between them. Whoa, okay, hold on. Let's. Whoa. Already, already, already. That's two Marx things that I'm just like, no. What? Marxist Leninism is not nationalist. I, I don't it's not nationalist democracy. Like it's neither a democracy nor it's nationalist. That's that's the most idiotic thing. And not only that, who's the one that's comparing FDR to uh, the fascists? It's Moldbug. He did. And, that, and like, what I what I liked was no 18th century writer would blah blah blah. It's like hello, the French Revolution. <laughs> I know, hello? right? Hello, <laughs> hello, guys. <laughs> Or for that matter, the American Revolution. Because because many American revolutionary writers, for example, Tom Paine, uh, would have probably identified with a lot of New Deal concepts. Good point. Because, right, Tom Thomas Paine was, mo quote, more progressive in that respect. And, in fact, he initially favored the French Revolution. Well, for that matter, so did Thomas Jefferson, by the way. Yeah. I mean, this is ridiculous. Okay. Next to its enemies, universalism clearly retained most of the classical European tradition, and it's certainly my favorite of the three. I'm grateful for its victory. Well, Logos, you could have he could have fooled me because so far he doesn't seem so grateful. Yeah. But the uh, <clears throat> mid 20th century Germans and the Soviet Union were entire civilizations. They cannot be dismissed lightly. Serious, sincere, intelligent, and well intentioned men and women devoted their lives to these movements which now strike us as perverse, absurd, and doomed. I have personal evidence of this because my father's parents were American communists, grandpa enlisted in the army to fight mustache man, and his letters from Europe tended to close with phrases like, keep faith in the party. Well into the 1970s, the serious, sincere, intelligent, and well-intentioned people used phrases like party line with zero ironic intent. I find it slightly difficult to imagine grandpa, Gramps, as a, great neck apparatchik in some alternate history, but I don't find it utterly impossible. Serious, sincere, intelligent, and well-intentioned men and women still devote their lives to universalism and to the polygon. That is our equivalent of the party. Even on the web, it is possible to live within an entirely universalist bubble. Entirely within a universalist bubble. In a world where the New York Times is always right, and there's nothing under heaven and earth which is not taught at Stanford. If you are reading you are, presumably you are at least suspect that this too might pass. By far and away, the best primary commentator on NS is Victor Kempler. Kempler's diaries and or LTI plus Michael Berlay's history make a pretty good NS 101. I have searched in vain for any readable pro-NS or at least neutral writer, but Spears' memoir is interesting. If self-serving, Ernst Younger, though an anti-NS, is unforgivable, unforgettable taste of German militarism, and Leon de Grel is a little too rabid. I still need to check out Klein's post-war memoirs. If anyone has any other pointers, please let me know. I, I mean, I just feel like he's just name dropping here. Like, I can't imagine he's read any of these people. I mean, 
he could have read them, but there's a difference between like reading in quotes and like really reading. Well, right, right. You might you might read it at a surface level, like for example, a child might read the Chronicles of Narnia, and that's all well and good. But if an adult reads it, he's going to see a lot more and understand a lot more of what's there than just a superficial reading. Good writing about communism is much easier to find. Presumably this is because the system lasted much longer, but it's also partly because whereas the NS despised and exiled the intelligentsia, the Bolsheviks courted and employed them. There are too many great chroniclers of communism to count, but three of my favorites are Lev Navrazov, Vladimir Bukovsky, and Viktor Kempler, whose East German diaries are perhaps his most interesting. Kempler, no communist before the war, actually wound up in the East German parliament. If you think your grip on reality is so strong that you could never serve a criminal regime or choose a greater evil over a lesser one, perhaps you were a better man than Kempler, but who dares such a claim should first read his books? I thought I'd like I thought I'd type in a bit of Bukowski and Navrazov first by way of advertisement for these heroic and criminally underappreciated writers whose notorious pit bull lawyers I have, however, fear not at all. And second, to support some of the claims I've made about the Soviet system. First, on the relationship between the Universalist press. The dissidents in the Soviet regime, Bukovsky from To Build a Castle, page 354, the setting is the late 60s and early 70s, when the dissident movement was getting off the ground. How hard it had once been to get this kind of publicity. Foreign correspondents in Moscow, partly because they were afraid of being expelled and losing a good job, partly because they had been co-opted and misled, were extremely shy of informing their papers of the repressions that were taking place. It was much simpler and more advantageous for them to reprint the statements of TASS and the Soviet press. There were still difficulties now. The authorities expelled anyone who got too friendly with us, but there were far more of them ready to take their chances. Interest in our problems was growing in the outside world, and whereas before an expelled correspondent might be regarded by his newspaper as unprofessional, Explosion was now seen, expulsion was now seen as the norm and occasionally even as an honor. It is possible to speak of an absence of freedom of information. In it. Is it possible to speak of an absence of information, absence of freedom of information in a country where tens of millions of people listen to Western radio, where Samus Dot exists and is regularly sent abroad, and everything said today will be public knowledge tomorrow? Of course, we had to pay a high price for making it public knowledge, but that was another matter. An original radio game even came into being. People would come to Moscow from the farthest ends of the country in order to tell about their troubles, then would hurry home in order to hear about them over the BBC, Radio Liberty, Deutsche Welle, etc. Raising their hands in astonishment, they would say to their neighbors, how do you like that? How the hell do they could they find out about these things in London or Munich or Cologne? This had been much more effective than sending complaints to Brezhnev. A Moscow woman once stopped me in the doorway and tried to persuade me to help her get her roof repaired. Why don't you get the BBC to criticize them? They'll soon get their skates on then. Otherwise, we won't get anything for the next three years at least. Bukowski is excellent on the practicalities of the strategy of fighting communism with Western assistance. The entire goal of the dissident movement was to replace the official intelligentsia as the apex of intellectual fashion in the Soviet universe. And once this succeeded, it's tempting if historicists to say that communism had no chance. And the fact that the Western intelligentsia figured out that it should prefer Brodsky and Solzhenitsyn to Shakalov and Svetlov was a crucial ingredient in the strategy. As a writer, however, Lev Navrazov, whose son Andrei I pirated here, is simply in another class. On the jacket of his education of Lev Navrazov, a 20th century, a genuine 20th century classic, Robert Massey compares him to a combination of Proust and Orwell. I didn't find this at all hyperbolic, and Navrazov is simply unsurpassable on the world of the Soviet intelligentsia, which he knew intimately but managed to keep his distance from. Here's the entire first chapter of the education. The West, the West, my guest chimes, looks, looking intimately on, I was in the West. He likes our country house, and he is sitting leisurely, he is sitting leisurely arm wing-like over chair back, shredding, shedding words. Oh, let us shed words as our garden shed in Samber. I was in the West. I talked with Ezra Pound, just as I'm talking with you. I dined with Sartre. Nothing special. You exaggerate, really. What he also likes is our almost extraterrestrial seclusion. There, outside beyond that fence that runs all around our estate, he is a writer, which is not what was once meant by the word here or is now meant in the West. 
It means that he is an official, or better say, a ranker, attached to the Department of Literature and a defender of rank. He is a member of the Board of the Union of Writers. Everyone is attached to some department because if he is not, he is a parasite. That is criminal to be exiled to some remote area to work there as a serf peasant. I'm not attached to any department, a circumstance I recall sometimes with the numbness of a criminal too long and too safely immersed in his crime, and sometimes with my father's Russian sloth despair, which has been provoking my mother's high-pitched lament addressed once to my father and now to myself. But why didn't you do it long ago? You are liter you are a psychopath, a real psychopath. As a translator of literature, how metallic is the name of my profession? I could have become a member of the Union of Writers many years ago, but I did not. Horribly enough, I have not become even a trade union member at any departments of which I freelance. Am I a parasite? Not far from my country house is the country house with less acreage of a member of Politburo or a candidate member of a Politburo. I've never been interested which exactly. Surely parasites live in huts, not in country houses with more acreage than that of members or even a candidate members of the Politburo. I am a psychopath, a real psychopath, or at any rate, a statistical exception, a Paulson rare event, eluding the departmental mesh. No department can understand that I could become a member of some department with all the advantages accruing, but would not. Each department assumes that I belong to another department, perhaps so very high that no one knows my rank. I am the only strictly private person in the country, as my guest calls me, living on a kind of extraterrestrial state, and he likes to come and forget his rank for a while and simply be a temporary dweller of this island outside of time and space. And what is there? He wants asked, pointing at something looming between the trees beyond the invisible fence. Oh, there, I peered, surfed him. Foreign correspondents stayed the night at my country house after a New Year's party and nothing happened. My son never joined any children's organization, nor did he ever go to school. See, my guest exults, you were freer than you would have been in America. Yes, except that I couldn't spare, say, $100 billion a year to defend my freedom. I merely exist in a crevasse between departments. This, by the way, is why I get all the books from abroad and you don't. The Department of Literature that watches over you will not watch over me because I am not its responsibility. Our timeless serenity is actually only a few miles from an airport where foreign statesmen land, some score miles from Moscow. But as one rides from the airport, it is all forced and we are lost and then we are pleasantly invisible. Yeah, first chapter is long. So uh, I want to say something real quick before I keep reading. Two things that immediately jump out to me is one, uh, the sort of like Kafka-esque nature that Navrazov is criticizing is now fully present in the United States today. I mean, arguably it was even present in 2007 when this was being written, which just goes to show that there's a, so there's a certain underlying similarity between Western systems of government and the Soviet Union, the fact that they're converging on the same levels of absurdity. The other thing that's interesting is Navrazov is saying that he exists in a crevice between departments so he can get away with things that nobody else could. Well, I mean, that's what I've been saying, Logos. you got to find these cracks and crevices and exist in there, and then nobody looks at you. What also goes to what you were saying about how a system gets more increasingly complex, everybody's going to find ways to point fingers to other people within their department, to the department, and so on. And so people who can manage to not be in a department can not be really held accountable, and so they can really take advantage of the complexity of a system to do some real damage or whatever they're trying to do. Exactly. Well, that, that goes back to that one poem by Kipling. Um, what was it? Uh, the, uh, the, I think it was the pick song where they talk about, you know, not rats gnawing a rope uh, and, you know, uh, moths tearing a coat, right? No, nobody bothers to, to look at these things, but these things that nobody bothers about undermine the integrity of the entire society. Our timeless serenity is actually only a few miles from an airport whose foreign statesmen land some score miles from Moscow, but as one rides from the airport, it is all force and we are lost in them. We are pleasantly invisible. I like him for his genuine, that is self-analytic sincerity. It is so rare. He brings his new published book. He knows I will not say a word about it, and he is grateful. But he can resist opening and admiring the page, bearing his picture. Holding the open book in his outstretched hand, raised so that he has to look up to gaze at the portrait of an elderly man, obviously having a bad liver. He finally recites in a languishing whisper the famous line a Russian poetess once addressed to her aristocratic seducer, how handsome you are, O oh devil. And then he asked me apprehensively if I expect anyone today. People are monsters, he explains monsters. As a shy afterthought, he adds, I am a monster too, of course, but at least I can abide myself. 
Today he is out of luck. Very carefully, I break the news. Yes, it will be that man's wife, but she will only drop in on her way somewhere much too important to stay long. My guest rank in literature is not the highest, and he shuns people either below his rank because they may try to humiliate him, if only to take revenge for their loneliness, or of the same rank because they may be even more insolent, entitled as they are to regard themselves as his equal. But that man, he is younger than he. Once his rank in literature was properly lower, and now it is higher. I know that the man is a kind of tumor inside my brain, he says in one of these flashes of lucidity for which I like him so much. I am like a clerk in the department of railroads who can talk only about another clerk promoted ahead of him. In justice, he cries out like Prometheus to the blind heavens, but he forgets that neither his listeners nor the blind heavens may belong to the department of railroads, and the immensity of injustice is lost on them. Unlike Prometheus and Aeschylus, my guest can enact his fate only in mute oppressive gloom throughout that man's wife's visit. I know this is stupid, he says. I picture myself very elegant and ironic with a coronation, carnation in my lapel, saying something really devastating about her husband, but in such a subtle, witty way that everyone is charmed, but it doesn't work. Her husband, while on the uh, one hand, he is a famous writer, almost like a Gogol, Chekhov, or Steinbeck. On the other hand, he is a serf of a high rank, much higher indeed than my guests, and as such, he is allowed to go abroad quite well while my guests went out once or twice in his life. This is what is meant when he says that he was in the West. In the early 18th century, in Russia, under the Tsar, or rather serf owner Peter, there were as yet no noblemen in the latter-day sense. Noblemen, too, were serfs, only they were ranked. These ranked serfs were attached to various departments. Literally, the word serfdom and serf and the Russian language mean the right of attachment and attached. Her husband is attached to the Department of Literature. Private, that is, small-scale surf owners in Russia before 1861, owned surf musicians, surf engineers, or surf actors, who did not differ outwardly from musicians, engineers, or actors of the West. Some surf owners even had surf astronomers, surf composers, and surf theologians, but surf writers, what are they for? The answer involves a certain linguistic difficulty. Even English language, not to mention the Russian, carries residual servile psychology. Is this surprising? Here is one of the numerous plaints that was the government had done was to transform every man not merely into an inquisitor, but into a judge, a spy, and informer. To set father against father, brother against brother. Russia, after 1917. No, England shortly before, historically, the fathers of these Englishmen who lived in 1917 could well remember the time. Uh, again, another interesting thing to say here is in his book on the origins of the rise of uh, private property in Russia under the old regime, Richard Pipes points out that this, this servile attitude of Russia. Now, uh, Navrazov here is tying it to a kind of psychology based on language and law. And what's interesting is the nature of the revolution, right? The American Revolution was very different than the Russian Revolution in part. That was an expression of national characteristics. And the Russian national, national characteristics are just that, you know, servile. But I think what's the real interesting question that a lot of people don't talk about is prior to the Mongol conquest, Russia did have these organic representative institutions uh, that have, you know, were stamped out first by the Golden Horde and then by the Muscovites. So this is, this, that's an interesting uh, thing to talk about. And I'll probably do a video next year on this whole question of like the Russian identity and where it went wrong in history. Um, anything you want to add to that, Logos? Not even a little. I know nothing about Russia. Okay. You Russians have never known freedom. A Britisher who had been in Britain, a spy for the owners of Russia, explained to me with Baron, Byron-esque languor, like a tone-deaf musicating German, explained that only Germans can really create and understand music, for did not music flourish in Germany as nowhere else. Actually, all mankind lived in the underworld of history for a millennia, and even the English-speaking countries have emerged from the dark millennia of unfreedom right now by the scale of history and have survived so far, owning perhaps just to the English Channel and the Atlantic Ocean. It is not therefore surprising at all that servile, servile psychology is still built even into the English language. Those he sees only a bank transport are in this language called private persons and hence bandits, especially if they come from the poor, did not go to college and want money just to live better. But those who seize one-sixth of the inhabited globe with everything and everyone therein are called a state. Similarly, small serf owners are called private persons and hence serf owners, while very big serf owners can only be called a state. And these serfs, subjects, or citizens. 
about 24 centuries ago, an Athenian said, if you are caught committing any of these crimes on a small scale, you are punished and disgraced. They call it a sacrilege, kidnapping, burglary, theft, and brigandage. But if besides taking their property, you turn all their countrymen into slaves, you will hear no more of these ugly names. Your countrymen themselves will call you the happiest of men and bless your name. He might have added, and for the next 24 centuries, even the language of the freest countries will be so constructed as to call significantly big surf owners a state and their serfs citizens. And the big surf ownership that post-1917 Russia is, the state did not exist even in the sense of Hobbes. Characteristically, the Russian word translated into English as state actually means lordship, masterdom, and the word translated as power derives from the verb to possess, to own. In the autocratic state of Hobbes, the subject had the liberty to buy and sell and otherwise contract with each other to choose their own abode, their own diet, and their own trade of life and institute their children as they themselves saw fit and the like. None of these seven liberties of Hobbesian absolutism nor the like exist today in the serf ownership once called Russia. So now obviously I'm not going to ask you what you think about Russia, but you've been reading Hobbes lately. Would you agree this is a correct uh, uh, statement of Hobbes' thought? Uh, let's go over it again. Um, an autocratic state of Hobbes, the subject had the ability to buy, sell, otherwise, and contract each other, treat their own boat, their own diet, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, it seems pretty reasonable. Cool. Because there's philosophy breaking in there, so. Yep. This is an obvious benefit for a surf ownership to play on the residual servile psychology and ignorance of the populace of democracies and simulate a state or even the world's only genuine democracy. In this way, the surf owners are recognized by democracy still playing an important role in the world, and their surf ownership is thus legalized as a state. But of course, only big surf owners can afford the state simulation, and the bigger they are, the bigger and better state simulation they can afford, and the more surfs they can attach to activities like literature. What state can thereby be without literature and not only to the theater or music as small private surf owners did in Russia before 1861? Well, what's interesting here is now obviously he's using, he's using a Russian-centric perspective, but a lot of this reminds me of uh, Lysander Spooner's No Treason, where he basically calls the, the U.S. government a, a band of criminals. Now, I don't know if Navrazov was an anarchist, but it definitely has anarchist uh, a tinge to it. Would you agree, Logos? Yeah, I would. What should this literature be like? On the one hand, it would be the best if it consisted of one sentence. Be infinitely devoted to your beloved owners. Repeat it as many times as is necessary to fill in each book of required thickness. All the serfs in the serf ownership would read the sentence over and over again and would be infinitely devoted to their beloved owners. But then these noisy intellectuals in the West would say, what sort of literature is that? The outside world remembers that the Russia of the first half of the 19th century, essentially owing to one man, Gogol. From the point of view of a foreign prestige, the Department of Literature should produce literature, not literature. But the trouble was that Gago was not a serf. He was not attached. He did not write over and over again, be infinitely devoted to your beloved owners. In fact, at school we were taught, Gogol exposed mercilessly the entire regime of Nicholas I. Having done what he would, go back and forth between Italy and Russia, never molested or impeded. The Department of Literature does not prescribe any uniform. A writer is to be dressed like Gogol or Chekhov or Steinbeck. This is his uniform. He should like a writer. Many serfs look, in fact, as though they were in old Russia or in the West in freedom. Partly the writer's rank is explicit, members of the Secretariat of the Union of Writers. But partly it is implicit yet decisive, just as it would have been at the end of the, at the 18th century Russian court. Well, what's interesting here, too, he's, he's again talking about this idea of somehow being outside of the scope or the jurisdiction, or the understanding of the state, so that you can act in ways that nobody else can act. I mean, in many ways, this is what I've been saying for the last couple of weeks. Yeah, it is. So, I mean, whoever this Navrazov guy is, he seems to know what he's talking about. So, that man, that writer, writer, her husband, why can he become a writer and I not? I would become sick if I were to put on a real tweet and law on a chair somewhere in Paris or New York like these two surf boys of the pre-1861 times playing at a gentleman in the drawing room when their owners were visiting somewhere. Smoking real cigars, too. The boys so believed they were gentlemen that when the owners came, they attached, attacked them as intruders in the agony of disillusionment, and one boy cut his throat with a razor. He is better than I am. He is a kind, tactful, generous, 
a better man, really. And once he helped me without any prospect that I would ever be important enough to reciprocate. Whenever he meets me, he quotes something from a short manuscript I gave him to read several years ago. And he says only what very considerate, successful men say to failures. How can he enjoy being a surf writer? It is perhaps simply that he comes from a poor family. Yes, perhaps of a long line of pre-1861 surfs. I am more finicky, more squeamish. I cannot eat if someone has spat into my plate. Is this connected with my getting car sick so easily? I cannot go to Paris or New York and play at being a writer. And him, the generations of hungry, miserable, humiliated people clamor for what a high surf rank they give him. They devote it all wolfishly, even if serfdom has spat into his plate. I first met him several years ago when the times were the most lenient in the last 30 or 40 years, and he was very much like any writer who had succeeded in any country in old Russia and the West. He was a success, almost as in any other country, and I was a failure, almost as in any other country. Of course, I could blame the society, but what failure doesn't? At that time, I still lived in what would have struck him as a monstrous super slums compared with his new apartment with its vestibule of marble. I did not want to work for money more than two or three days a month, and under my suit coat, I wore my late uncle's lilac shirt, which he had bought in England in the, in the 20s. The shirt had a huge stain, like a strange, dark, vast continent on a map. So good for navigation with many coves. The continent was also lilac, only a darker hue, but at a commission store, would not accept the shirt for resale, though the stain was invisible under a suit, especially with a tie. And so I got it as a gift, but I had lost one of my copper cufflinks and discreetly kept the parting cuff together. He was a success, almost as in any other country, and a success is success. He traveled abroad and had all the latest books and magazines and records, and he said Salazar in his diary, and Salazar's diary was just out. In a closed surf territory, even those who once belonged to the country's creative genius finally began to write and say something musty, something smelling of old bookcases, that terrible, all-pervading, musty smell. And here he said Salazar in his diary. Oh, I remember that. I met him and his wife perhaps exactly as a failure meets a success anywhere. He had wanted or agreed to meet me, and that was important if I wanted to publish, and I did want. It was the best time in the last and perhaps the next three, 30 or 40 years, but a failure forgets what he wants when he meets success. I did not know what started me off. Perhaps it was his words, Salazar in his diary. Or perhaps it was his wife's stockings as I kissed her hand, I believe, like a derelict Russian gentleman. I looked at them as from the bridge at a cityscape below the stockings. God knows from what exclusive shop in what Western capital were finely webbed in black-like cityscape of a French artist whose name I forgot. I was not a nobody, a funny beggar, just a maniac, most likely, holding together the cuff of his late uncle's shirt. I was free, young, happy. I forgot about the cuff. And when I noticed it, I would not understand how I could be so consci conscious about the missing cuff link. And I almost flaunted the parting cuff. It even gave a new turn to my euphoria. It was a note in a keyed time, but sp both spontaneous and contrived, for everything was unexpected and everything known in advance. He listed and said with, a genu with genuine regret how you are wasting your, yourself, how you are wasting yourself. In hindsight, I know that this had been a good pretext for me to say something like, but who will punish me, publish me with a broad hint what I knew he had a pull and if he helped me. But instead, I did what a failure usually does. I said wasting. The word was simply another note in the euphoria, wasting. Do you mean that what I am saying to you, too, is wasted, and if it is published, duplicated on an industrial scale for millions of strangers to buy, it will not be wasted? As a failure often does, I was making up a prodigality for years of humiliation. I was drinking in my transient glory. I wanted nothing else. I was waving my parting cuff. It was now my first violin. I was speaking with eternity to say something like, but who will publish me, was inconceivable. The literary world of the West today, of course, is not at all unrecognizable and Nav Rozov's rankers and members of the Union of Writers. Not that the U.S. has some petty department of literature. It vastly su surpasses the Soviet Union in this statistic. It has 2,000 departments of literature, one at each of its universities, which, of course, enjoy complete academic freedom. Despite this, they somehow seem to all say the same thing to the same people in the same ways. Perhaps this is because no further alignment enlightenment is possible. My girlfriend, among her many talents, is a playwright and a screenwriter, and when we saw the excellent new film about East Germany, The Lives of Others, we both noticed something rather striking, which was that East Berlin theater scene circa 1970 and the San Francisco theater scene circa 2007 didn't seem too different at all. 
Well, I mean, that's something I've been saying now for a while, Logos, is that the Eastern Bloc and the modern-day U.S. are converging on something very similar. Not that fat, ruthless NEA administrators forced aspiring actresses to put out, but in San Francisco in 2007, the members of... Well, but they do. I mean, what Harvey about, Weinstein. Yeah, come on, dude. Like, it didn't age well. <laughs> yeah, no, it didn't. Like, and Weinstein was tip of the iceberg. So, sure, Mobug, sure. But in San Francisco in 2007, the members of the Secretariat of the Union of Writers are really quite easy to identify in the process by which one obtains such a rank. Exactly the same, but who will publish me? In my opinion, there are two main differences between the old Soviet bloc and the present-day democratic West. One is the, that the West's civil service apparatus are not as strong, not as politically secure, not as well organized, not as smug. Well, that didn't age well. Did it? Nope. This difference is slowly but seemingly seems inexorably evaporating. The changes has gone farther in the East, as Bukowski himself points out. In the EU, as Bukowski himself points out. Two, the West has no West of its own. No 19th century state survived the democratic avalanche. When I say that democracy is the opposite of liberty, a statement which would strike most Westerners today as nonsensical, just as it might strike a faithful Soviet serf as nonsensical to say that communism is the opposite of progress. I have no examples even across some dog fence border to point to. And this difference is not evaporating at all. Okay, well, given the kinds of societies that Moldbug and the people that like him advocate, that's not true. He, you know, the Moldbugians are always pointing to Saudi Arabia, Dubai, Singapore. Um, I mean, if that's really what he thinks the ideal is, then it is out there. Or isn't it? After all, I'm posting this on the internet, a very accidental product of democracy. Certainly no one who developed... Wait a minute. Yeah. Who developed the internet thought of it as a blow against the state. No one thought he was programming the West's West. No, that's exactly what people who designed the internet said. Certainly no one who developed the internet thought of it as a blow against the state. I mean, there were so many people in the 90s and the early 2000s that believed you could have a direct democracy with the internet. Yeah, that's way to true. Just, that that was the whole that was the whole Silicon Valley trope. It's like, well, we're just going to be able to dispense with all of these autocratic institutions. I mean, I've talked to these people, and 2007, this kind of idea was in full swing. Well, <laughs> it's mold bug. And yet, through the magic of the blogger, you can hear me say, "Democracy is the opposite of liberty." And while I may not be able to convince you or anyone else. Of this proposition, I can at least defend it, and I can point to you other writers who say the same thing, none of whom you'll find unless you are very, very lucky at any democratic university or in any democratic newspaper or magazine or in any democratic TV or radio station. Of course, I'm not actually serious about this. Ha, huh, democracy is great, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Be infinitely devoted to your beloved owners. I mean, I don't even know the point. Of, I mean... Okay, I think I know the point of this, but the beginning of this doesn't make any sense with the rest of it. So he's supposed to be comparing, you know, Germany, Russia, and the United States. And then he he completely changes midstream into this discussion of a Soviet dissident about slipping into cracks. Like, that doesn't have anything to do with how this started. Yeah, I don't understand the point of this essay. It's a mess. Like, it, it doesn't make it... Again, the introduction has nothing to do with the rest of this essay. It's very strange. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Against Political Freedom, August 16th, 2007. Oh, wow. I am quite sure there are still some UR readers who believe in democracy. I'm even supposed to be a generalist, and it hasn't escaped my notice that I've been concentrating exclusively on this particular spot on the pinata. It's a tough one, and it may take a couple of more whacks than when I will move on to more fun stuff. If you already feel convinced, if you are ready to open the window, stick your head out, and yell like Peter Finch and Network in your screen, please be sure to include the full URL. If you just howl, you are. They are unlikely to understand you, and you've done enough, and you can skip this one. Let's call anyone who believes in democracy a demotist. A demotist 
is just anyone who has a positive association with a compound of demos and kratos. He or she thinks of democracy in general, if not necessarily every specific use to which this vague and ancient term has ever been attached itself, is basically a good thing. Presumably the anti-demotist would be one who disbelieved in democracy, who thought that democracy in general is basically a bad thing. And anti-demotist might use the word demotist in much the way some demotists seem to call anything they don't like fascist. Well, so this is the problem, Logos. And we ran into this uh, last week with, with Moldbug talking about democracy. In the ancient sense, right, we have examples of, of quote, democratic regimes, which most people today would no longer consider democratic. But, you know, arguably since Athens gave us the idea and the name and the concept, it's difficult to argue that they're not democratic. Right. But then there's a different thing altogether, right, where we, we have in the modern enlightenment the sovereignty of the people. Now, typically, you know, the state was sovereign in the past because it could make some appeal to divine order, right? The divine right of kings. The king was sovereign because he was either a god, like in ancient Egypt or the Roman Empire, or the descendants or the friends of the gods. Um, to, the idea of the sovereignty of the people is not necessarily the same thing as popular government. And I think this is a mistake that Moldbug is going to continue to make. Yeah, I agree with that. Because, like, for example, right, did Athens, did, did Pericles believe in the sovereignty of the people? No, he believed in the sovereignty of the gods. But the form of government that he was in charge of made decisions based on group action. And so those are not the same thing. Uh, and so continuing to confuse them is going to be a problem. Can you imagine a 21st century post-demotist society, one that saw itself as recovering from democracy much as Eastern Europe sees itself as recovering from communism? Well, I suppose that makes one of us. The obvious problem is for any, any would-be anti-demotist to, is to explain the 20th century in which universalist liberal democracy fought and defeated fascism and communism. See my last post. Unless you are a NS or communist, you would have to explain how democracy can be bad. Yet the victory of democracy over non-democracy can be good. As I've explained, my answer is that all three of these con contenders were shoots from the branch of the 19th century democratic movement. All revered the people, all devised a doctrine by which the state represents, symbolizes, or otherwise identified with the people, and all attributed great importance to public opinion and went to great lengths to manage it. Okay, now see, that's where I knew Moldwag was going, you know, sovereignty and the people. But there's still, but which people? Like, that's the problem, right? If you're like NS, then it's not all people. It's just the folk that are your people that are the will you have to be concerned with. Whereas for the Soviets and the Americans who had more universal ambitions, it was theoretically all people. But anything you want to add to that? Not really. We talked about this last week. To borrow the cladistic method of biology, biological taxonomy, just as a human, a gorilla, and a chimpanzee are equally related or unrelated to a baboon, universalism, fascism, and communism are equally related or unrelated to monarchism. Just as a human may find the gorilla and chimpanzee vaguely baboon-like, a universalist is likely to think of a fascist or communist dictator as somehow monarchy-like. But to a baboon, an ape is an ape, and biology supports this claim. The baboon, therefore, is perfectly within his right in generalizing across the whole ape clade. He notes the general tendency of apes to slaughter, dismember, and otherwise abuse baboons. That's not all apes are bad apes, he will cheerfully admit. Indeed, he's very interested in knowing how to tell a good ape from a bad ape. But the general prop proposition that apes are dangerous and scary strikes him as quite uncontroversial. I am neither a baboon nor a monarchist, however... When we look at the astounding violence of the democratic era, it strikes me as quite defensible to simply write off this whole idea as a disaster and focus on correcting the many faults of monarchism. Again, as I've said in a previous uh, discussion, this is ridiculous. The reason why we had all the bloodshed in the, in the 19th and 20th centuries was because of technological progress that could mobilize the entire population. Let's go back to the Peloponnesian War when the Athenians and the Spartans were fighting each other, Athens and democracy didn't have a death toll anywhere near on the scale of the American Civil War, World War I, or World War II. And so then you have to ask the question, why? <laughs> because, well, the, the technological conditions were not there. And then furthermore, 
You could look at also Iceland. You know, Viking Iceland is considered a kind of democracy. The the the, the violence was very small scale. It wasn't in the you know hundreds of millions, you know, tens of millions like we saw. And again, this is just I don't know why Moldbug can't see this. Okay, why was World War One so deadly? Poison gas machine guns, and high explosive artillery. Does any of that have anything to do with democracy logos? Not even a little. This is ridiculous. This is so brain damaged. It's modern technology that makes war lethal. And, yeah. and it's also modern technology in the, inter, in the interconnected global economy that makes it... That's why we have the total war. Because even, quote, civilians are producing war materials. That's just how the economy is structured. Yeah. And I mean, let's just make this really, really easy. Suppose back in 2007, Kim Jong-un secretly had a nuke all along and nuked the world, right? Does that mean that dictatorships have produced the highest body count because they destroyed the entire planet? Like, No, this, because this Kim Jong-un is well, he's the modus, bro. <laughs> he's Schrodinger's he's... democracy. Just screw this. <laughs> screw all this nonsense. <laughs> Certainly, it's hard to imagine how the Civil War, World War One, World War II, um, the thing that will not be named, could have occurred in a world where the Stuarts, Bourbons, Hollandsons, Habsburgs, and Romanovs still ruled. It's like, bro, how about the Thirty Years' War? Yeah, imagine a Thirty Years' War with World War One technology. Well, but even the Thirty Years' War itself was a bloodbath between royal houses. Yeah. Right. It was. It was the Habsburgs, the French, the Swedes. There's all monarchs here, man. There, I don't see any demotists. Um, and it was a bloodbath. Yeah. So, and again, the, 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 okay, there's a reason why conflicts prior to World War I, with maybe the exception of Napoleon, were had low body counts. The Thirty Years' War was so hellacious, so bad, that everybody was like, never again. We're, we're not going to let war get this out of control. Yeah, now, th that consensus could have been achieved by any number of governments by any ways. Right. And again, if we look at modern day democracies, we see a similar trend after World War II, um, you know, international law, the Hague, the Geneva Conventions, all of these became far more important in conflicts to prevent them from escalating to what we saw in the two world wars. So we actually see the same um, pendulum swing after 1945 that we saw after 1648. Yeah. I mean, think about World War One, right? World War One started why? Well, the TLDR is a bunch of Serbian nationalists with support from Russia whacked the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, lighting the whole thing off. Right. So a monarch died. Oops. I mean, let, let's look at the players in World War One, right? So you had so, so Germany still had the Kaiser, didn't it? Yep. I I don't think that's super democratic. I mean, he lost some power, I reckon, before the war started, but I don't. I th I think he still had a lot more power than a usual democracy would. Y yes, more than say the King of England had. Well, there you go. Okay, so I mean, if if you go country by country, I, mean, I think Turkey was involved, a bunch of other. It didn't strike me that World War One was like all a bunch of democracies fighting each other. No. So, I mean, this, this, this whole narrative that democracy is the cause of these body counts is, is utterly absurd. I mean, the biggest democracy... Oh. Wait, 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 Logos, 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 I just hit me. This is the joke. He says, certainly it's hard to imagine how all these wars could have occurred where the Stuarts, Bourbons, Hollandons, Habsburgs, and Romanovs still reigned and ruled. Bloody hell, Logos, World War I, the Hollandons, Habsburgs, and Romanovs were reigning and ruling. There you go. I mean, I mean, it's literally nonsense. Yeah. It's literally nonsense because the the war starts in Serbia. And who are the three people that the three major empires that are involved in this? Habsburg, Austria, Romanov, Russia, Holland's all in Germany. It, his own statement contradicts itself. Right. I mean, the only reason the democracies got involved, right? Let's look at it. Britain got involved because they had a treaty, right? They had a treaty with some country that kind of like forced their hand. As I remember it. Well, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the TLDR is when Germany attacked France, uh, Britain used that as an opportunity. Well, really complicated. Russia and France had an alliance. When Russia got attacked, France mobilized. So then Germany 
attacked France. And then England was like, well, well hold on. We're not going to let France fall. So that they jump in. And this domino effect happened. Right. It's a bunch of treaties and foreign entanglements. It's not like democracy got everybody involved. It's treaties and foreign entanglements that got everybody involved. And those foreign entanglements, I mean, do you think they would have been less if you had a bunch of royalty, like marrying each other's you know, sons and daughters off and stuff like that and mingling bloodlines? But, those but, foreign entanglements would have been like way stronger, not less. But, but, but Logos, they did do that because the czar, the kaiser and the king of England were all related through Queen, of Queen Victoria. There you go. I mean, <laughs> who was one of the last people to get involved in World War One? I? I think it was America, right? Oops. And America was like the least, quote, it was like the least, quote, authoritarian of all the systems. It didn't have these royal bloodlines. It didn't have these entanglements. I mean, America kind of got involved because, as I understand it, like our bro England got involved. Like, I mean. <laughs> I know. I know. This like, I know. So let me coin another name for formalism and call it neo cam. Ah, here we go. Here Logos. we go. neo cameralism. Finally, the name comes on the scene. The word is mainly picked for its Google virginity, but it should also be reminiscent of cameralism. The governing philosophy of Frederick the Great, whose anti-Machiavelli is a good reading for anyone wondering what went wrong in the 19th and 20th centuries. Of course, if you're a demotist, maybe you don't think anything went wrong at all. So here's another thing too, okay? There, there's, there's a certain... This, I think, Moldbug probably got from Hop, who probably got it from reactionary Catholics, that somehow monarchy equals good government. The, the, only, the only European monarchy in the modern age that was ever well run was Germany, Prussia. But that has more to do with the national characteristics of the Germans than anything else. Uh, Austria, Hungary, and Russia were basket cases. And so... You know, only if you pick that one country, which is what Moldbug does, can you even have a leg to stand on. But you, you have to to extrapolate that beyond Germany uh, is is just grossly uh, ridiculous. The basic right. ins the basic insight of cameralism was that well governed states tended to be prosperous. This was associated with a variety of primitive economic theories such as mercantilism, which are probably best discarded. No, oh, okay, logos. Go ahead. That's your that's your cue. Uh, I don't know much about cameralism or mercantilism, so I actually don't have anything to say about this. Okay. And cameralism was, of course, associated with monarchism, whose biological vagaries are infamous. A family business is a, is a great idea if your business is a corner store or an auto, auto body shop. If you have a continent to run, you want professionals. To a neurocameralist, a state is a business which owns a country. A state should be managed like any other large business by dividing logical ownership into negotiable shares, each of which yields a precise fraction of the state's profit. A well-run state is very profitable, and each share has one vote, and the shareholders elect a board which hires and fires managers. The business customers are its residents. A profitably managed neo caramel estate will, like any business, serve its customers efficiently and effectively. Misgovernment equals mismanagement. Well, that is aged like crap logos don't you feel like modern day corporations serve your interests so well as the consumer i mean there's that the other question too is one of the things that forces corporations to be um effective it's not even working well anymore these days but in theory what forces a corporation to be effective is the the, the customer can go elsewhere right if, if the customer can't go elsewhere then if the corporation's crap, what's the customer going to do? That they can't not purchase because if it's an essential good, they have to buy what the company's selling. And if there's no alternatives, then the corporation loses no market share or anything like that from you know going to crap. Well, now let's look at this this model about the state being a corporation. You're born in a state, right? You don't like the way your state corporation is being run. Do you automatically get to, to go to another state? Probably not. Not unless you're going to be Soviets and make this like a global a global communist revolution, right? So your country goes neo cameralist You have a business. You're now born of this 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 business run corporate state. Okay, you don't have any passports or anywhere to go necessarily. You have to actually get permission from another state to enter, which is really bloody hard. Okay, so do, does your your state corporation have the same incentives as a normal market corporation? No. There's a lot of entrapped customers to which the barriers to entry to live in a competitive state are too hard 
And so by frictions, they're, they're just going to stay where they're at. So it's not like the normal corporation where you can just vote with your wallet. Uh, so that, that's gone. Uh, what's the other one? Uh, lots of substitutes. This isn't polycentric law. This is a single board running the state like a single corporation. So, so you can't switch. So you, 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 you can't abstain from buying because you're talking about basic security and other essentials the states provide. So this isn't a good you can just not buy ever. And you have no alternatives, and you can't like go to an alternative very easily if you're a consumer. So all the market incentives that should keep corporations in line completely fail here. I don't know why they would think that just because you call it a corporation without the the, the market incentives that make corporations tick, um, that you're going to get any of the benefits. You have to have the economic pressures mm -hmm. of competition on corporations mm -hmm. to get the benefits of corporations. But as we're seeing these days, even those market pressures are no longer sufficient as corporations slowly monopolize. So what the hell, man? I know. I know. I know. For example, a neo cameral estate will work hard to keep any promises it makes to its residents. Evidence? Evidence logos? Yeah, right. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna quote the other libertarian that everybody loves to rag on, Stefan Molyneux, hashtag not an argument. Not because some even more powerful authority forces it to, but because it is a very pleasant and reassuring thing to live in a country where the government can be trusted. And it's scary and awful to live in a country where it can't. <laughs> What is this, Logos? I mean, yeah. I mean, suppose everything he's saying is right. You have to have perfect freedom of movement in order for that to mean anything. Mm -hmm. But what do you, well, Todd, what do you need to make the system run? You need every every country in the globe to have a similar system. Mm -hmm. You need to have freedom of movement so that people can, can vote with their feet and go to the corporations that serve them best. Now, mm -hmm. what does it sound like, Todd? What is, what is perfect freedom of movement and a unified global government where all the countries all have the same universal principles of government. Uh -oh. Are we talking about universalism here? Is this a universal? Sounds pretty universalist to me, Todd. And all it also sounds very Brahmin to me. It is very Brahmin. Since trust once broke broke and takes a long time to rebuild. A state that breaks its own laws has just given its capital a substantial haircut. Its stock is almost certain to go down. That's aged like crap. Look at look at the Biden administration, man. Yeah. I mean, heck, look at the Bush administration when this was being written. You would have thought with all of the mistakes that the Bush administration made. Uh, no, no. I mean, you know, the, the system still went along, even though a lot of people were critical of it. Suppose, for example, that our neocameral estate raises all its revenue with a property tax, a la Henry George. One easy way to run a property tax regime is a self-assessment registry. Every real estate owner lists and updates their respective price for every property and anyone who can buy at this price. If an owner sets the price too high, they will pay too much tax. If they set it too low, their property will be snapped up. The system is trivial to administrator admin, to administ <laughs> Wait, the system is trivial to administrate, I think is what he wants to say. Its laughter curve should be easy to map, and its curve's peak should be quite high. Well, one, Logos, how is this not communism where the state owns all your property? Because if you don't pay taxes, he tells you, it's going to get snapped up. Logos? You still with us, Logos? Oh, shoot, my mute button was hit. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm reading over this a second. This is a lot. This is dense. Every real estate owner lists and updates a reserve price for every property. Everyone can buy at the price. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. If owners set the price too high, they'll pay too much tax. If they set it too low, their property will be snapped up. Um, the system is trivial to administer. Its laugher curve should be easy to map, and the curve's peak should be quite Hi. Uh, yeah, in this case, there would actually be a laugher curve. Um, sorry, what was the original question? Well, my original question was, is if you have a property tax regime, is how is that not communism? Because if you don't pay your taxes, the state takes it. Yeah, that's one of the real problems with Georgism is that, um, I mean, even even most modern Georgists would just say that, like, well, you can have like one private, you know, one personal property 
well, even even making the personal private proper distinctions, communism, right? So <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah, usually usually you have like a personal property that's either taxed exceptionally low or or immune from this. It's like extra properties like factories and you know, second houses and things like that that are that are taxed under the Georgist regime, just to make sure that companies aren't, you know, people can't get, you know, taxed out of their house and home and they have like, mm -hmm. you know, their own stable land to do stuff with. But yeah, I mean, the, 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 the making the personal private property distinction, this whole model is going to end up being like very, very amenable to communism. My goodness. Oh my. Oh my. Oh my. <clears throat> it's easy to value the single state tax as an enterprise. The value of the corporation is a function of its tax rate and the total value of its real estate. Assuming tax rates are fixed by contract, the neo Cameron estate's incentive is simply to maximize property prices. Any policy that would make it less pleasant place to live or work is clearly contradicted. I don't think that follows necessarily. Cause like what if, for example, you have an industrial district, which you still need, but it's going to lower property values around it. But without the industrial district, you can't produce the uh, manufactured goods that you want. Yeah, the the other issue too is you have states that are getting worse and worse to, and worse to live in every year, and yet property values are still going up and up and up and up and up. So, I mean, what's going to dictate the the property values overall is going to be your your the, the population, your country, and the use for the property, like like the, lo the locational use of the property. Mm -hmm. Like people will pay a bunch of money to live in California, even though there's crap on the streets, typhus might be coming back and all sorts of other doomsday stuff happens there every other week because it's nice beast front property. It's a port. So it's like, it's a shipping center and it's already got large infrastructure networks for internet data universities, which fuel the, the technological economy. So like, mm -hmm. as long as that that's going strong, those values are going to keep going up and up and up as the world population goes up and everybody wants to live there. So mm -hmm. like, what are you going to do? Yeah. Imagine, therefore, that Holler and Zell and Prussia had somehow failed to degenerate into a quasi-democratic nationalist militarism, but instead had listed shares in London, or imagine the 21st century Singapore, Dubai, or Hong Kong could somehow do an IPO. We can examine the demotus period from our safe, if imaginary, neo cameralist future. Clearly, the worst forms of demotism, the really bad apes, were the totalitarian systems, Fascism and communism. The main difference between fascism and communism was not in mechanism, but in origin. Fascist elites tend to be militaristic, communist elites intellectual, but the one party state is a clear case of convergent evolution. To a neo cameronalist, wait, 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 wait. Well, then, wouldn't that make it convergent evolution with monarchies? Yes. Don't, don't, don't. Right. I mean, yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, if you're going to say that, you've kind of opened yourself up for that. I mean, yeah. What are, what are monarchies? But one party state. There's one party. and It's the royal party. Done. Mm -hmm. Done. To a neo cameralist totalitarianism is democracy in its full blown, most malignant form. Th OK, that's dumb. This is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. OK, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Democracy doesn't always deteriorate into totalitarianism and lifting up at the gas pump doesn't always engulf you in a ball of fire. Many people with cancer live a long time or die or something else instead. This doesn't mean you should smoke half of Virginia before lunch. Okay, so this gets this is a, this is the distinction that Moldbug and many like him just refuse to make. We need to make a distinction between a decision-making process, okay, called democracy. We saw that in ancient Athens, we saw that in Puritan New England, we saw that in medieval Iceland. Right. And then the idea that the sovereignty of the state is rooted in the people. Those are two very different concepts and one can have one and not the other. Well, even, even better, it's worse than that because look at, look at Germany just prior to world war two, right? Did mustache man come to power because people decided the sovereignty of the people was much, was the most important thing. No, no. I look at Weimar Germany was Weimar Germany a democracy. I don't think so. Well, it, I, it was supposed to be supposed to be, but it struck me as like a, as like a Western managed like satellite state. Well, that's kind of what it was in practice. Right. Well, that's the point. And the people of Germany weren't stupid. They knew it. Right. And so this wasn't democracy tending to, on some natural path as it degenerated into some kind of totalitarianism. This was Germany being like some failed satellite state where Mass inflation was happening. All sorts of other things were happening. Nothing was going right. 
And so they said, enough, we'll elect any strong man we need to fix this. Not because the people are sovereign, but because we don't care how the government's run as long as we can buy bread on Thursday. Yeah, that too. Yeah. So, so what is what is this argument that that there's some process from democracy to, to totalitarianism? Germany didn't have that track. Certainly didn't have that track. It went for the Kaiser. Russia didn't. To, Certainly to, Russia didn't. Russia went from a, a, a monarchy straight, straight to yeah. uh, some some communist dictatorship. There's no there's no degenerating force of democracy here. Um, the French Revolution. Well, no, 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 look, look, you, you know, you know the the meme where the Asian guy is squinting in a piece of paper and says he can't see it. Yeah, that's Moldbug. I mean, no, no kidding. Like that, that's, not, that's that's the most <laughs> dishonest argument I've ever heard in my entire life. It's like, so bad. Almost, any example he's bringing up, I, I I don't see this thing as transitioning from like a democracy to a tyrannical rule of the majority to like a dictator. I don't see it happening. Maybe if you want to say like Rome, Rome would be an interesting conversation because like, mm -hmm. um, you know, Rome had the Republic and it had a representative mm -hmm. democracy. But then the question is, well, did the democracy part break down? And that's why you had Caesar. Oh, which just kind but of like changing but, things. Yeah. But here's the thing. Here's why the democracy broke down and became a dictatorship. Right. Because wealthy, powerful interests brought up, bought up all the land, creating yep. a proletariat class that yep. demagogues could then appeal to, as well as the rich, wealthy elites, to then yep. take power. So, yeah. hmm. Hmm. now that's a right. narrative that Mold Moldbug's not going to like that narrative. Right. It's 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 not as if Rome switched to a, to a dictatorship because like a whole bunch of masses of people just decided, hey, we think we're sovereign and we're just going to like make a strong man do our bidding on our behalf, and this is how it's going to be. That's not how Rome went. That's not how France went in the French Revolution. Like, sure, the people had enough and revolted against the the Catholic Church and the the mm -hmm. the nobility of the area. Um, but I mean, even after the French Revolution, wasn't very democratic. At the Reign of Terror, you had Robespierre, you had mm -hmm. Napoleon. Ultimately, like, well, well, there's there's two other points here that are really relevant. How did Athens end? It, it didn't. It it didn't. The tyranny was before the democracy. Uh, the democracy was disrupted by Sparta when they lost the Peloponnesian War. But That's Athens true. never had a democracy that turned into a dictatorship. It didn't That's happen. True. Didn't happen. And the other thing that didn't happen is the world's oldest contiguous parliament is the Icelandic Althing, which was like from the 10th century AD. So over a thousand years, the democratic institutions of Iceland have been preserved. Yeah. A thousand years, and they've never devolved into tyranny. Like, what is Moldbug talking about? Right. Th I mean, there's no argument here. This is just dumb. No, this is dumb. Also, Herbert Hoover, in his Freedom Betrayed, which was published posthumously in 2011, when he visited Europe after uh, in the interwar period, uh, he asked. He went to Finland, and he asked the Finns, "Well, why are you the only Eastern European country that's?" resisting both communist totalitarianism and then fascist totalitarianism. And they said, we have democratic institutions going back to the days of the Vikings. There you go. Oh, what do you know? Whoa. What do you know? What do you know? This is ridiculous. This is so stupid. I mean, properly constituted democratic structures are what actually resist these kinds of impositions. And what under what, what the lesson of Rome is, Vast concentrations of wealth in the hands of a few people, like the senators, undermine those institutions. What do you know, Logos? What do you know? What do you know? Wow. We're going through it right now with the lobbyists. Oh, I know. Almost like we couldn't have seen it coming, Logos. Yeah, almost. But if don't look, worry. Don't worry. Just making us formally a corporation will make our problems even better. <laughs> No, no, no. Well, the joke is the joke is though right the only way we get by going back to navrazov is having this ambiguity with like cracks and crevices yeah so the ambiguity is actually good because it allows us to survive the nonsense if we formalize this it would be a hundred times worse oh well, that's a good point and 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 this is the guy that Moldbug is quoting favorably yeah I mean, the reason the reason why Navrazov was able to like you know eke out an existence is that the Soviet Union was not a hundred percent formalist. Mm -hmm. If it were, he would have had nowhere to go. Yeah. 
A political party is a political party. It is a larger group of people allied for the purpose of seizing and wielding power. If it does not choose to arm its followers, this is only because it finds unarmed followers more useful than armed ones. If it chooses less effective strategies out of moral compunction, it will be outcompeted by some less principled party. Um, I I think that's a case by case basis because obviously there's going to be blowback. I mean, let's look at Russia right now, right? Um, almost nobody likes Russia, right? All of its neighbors hate them: the Baltic states, Ukraine, the Caucasus, Central Asia. I mean, you know, Russia Russia being quote unquote pragmatic and realist has just created a sea of enemies on its doorstep that anybody, say the United States, could arm against them. Yeah. The other thing too, Logos, have you ever noticed how incompetent these alleged power realists are? Oh, ignore morality, bro. Just, just use power. Like, have any of these people ever won in the last 200 years? No. No. Because they don't know what they're doing. They're, they're, that's a whole other video. Mm-hmm. When one party gains control over the state, it gains a massive revenue stream that it can divert entirely to its followers. The result is a classic informal management structure whose workings should be clear to anyone who watched a few episodes of The Sopranos. Without a formal ownership structure in which the entire profit of the whole enterprise is collected and distributed centrally, money and other goodies leak from every pore. Totalitarian states are gangster states. In other words, and they tend to corruption and mismanagement, the personality cult of the dictator is quite misleading. A totalitarian dictator has little in common with a neo cameraless CEO or even a cameraless monarch. Well, but hold on, Logos, hold on. That's just convergent evolution, bro. Yeah, convergent evolution. He said so. He said so. The difference is the management structure. Oh, okay, here we go, here we go. The CEO and the monarch owe their positions to a law which all can obey and those who choose to obey the law are naturally a winning coalition against those who break it. I mean, what is there to say to that, Logos? I have no idea. The dictator's position is the result of his primacy in a pyramid of criminals. Okay, okay, let's look at the classic monarch here, Richard III. Does anybody think that Richard III got to be king of England because, to quote Moldbug, he owed his position to a law which all can obey. No, he freaking murdered everybody. He murdered his nephews. He mur- he murdered his brother. Okay, he got there the same way that. Wait for it, logos. Wait for it. A totalitarian dictator got there. Yep. Oh oh oh. I mean, like this is just. I can't. I can't. I can't, man. Um. The dictator's position is the result of his primacy in a pyramid of criminals. The structure is naturally unstable. Okay, again, a cursory reading of the history of England will tell you that monarchy is not stable. We had in the 12th century the anarchy of Stephen and Matilda, 20 years. We had the succession crisis in the, the War of the Roses, 15, 1453 to 1485. And then we had the, the, the succession, we had the crisis of the English Civil War. Like, this is clearly not a stable regime. But that's just because they weren't formalist enough, Todd. If everybody would have just known who was going to be in charge. Oh, okay, of course. You know, if we had a crystal ball, Logos, we would know who'd be in charge. That's right. Then there'd be, there'd be no friction and no violence. There we go. There, obviously. But you know you know who didn't have a rebellion, Logos? Stalin. True. I mean... <laughs> There is always some other gangster who wants your job. Dictators like mafia chiefs are not good at dying in bed. Well, dude, dude, the history of Byzantium, like there's like 30 emperors that had unnatural premature deaths. Okay. I mean, I I don't know what to say to this nonsense. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing more to say. The internal and external violence typical of totalitarian states is best examined, explained, I think, by this built in mismanagement. Dictators are violent because they have to be. They use violence as an organizing principle. A totalitarian state has no principle of legitimacy that would render it impractical for an ambitious subordinate to capture the state with a coup. European monarchs made war. Sometimes they were assassinated, and there were even succession struggles, but coups in the modern sense were very rare. Well, that's just semantical nonsense. Note that the final financial logic which keeps the neo-caramelist state lawful does not apply in any way to the totalitarian state, 
because the latter does not have a stable management structure, which is controlled by shareholders. Lawlessness is not profitable for the state as a whole, but it may be quite profitable for the part that chooses lawlessness. And in the totalitarian state, no one is counting as a whole. I'm like, we know, we know, we, know, we already know what a neo caramel estate looks like. It's called the East India Company. And it, and it maximizes its own profits at the expense of the people it rules over. Like, what is he talking about? Well, yeah, and this, this gets to the point, right? The states ruled over by the East India Company didn't exactly have any market alternatives, did they? So if you're in India and you're being ruled by this corporation, mm -hmm. it's not as if you go, you know, I don't like the way this corporation is serving me. I think I'm going to do business with another one. It wasn't open to you. And hence, they were able to be ruled with an iron fist because – where are the Indians going to go? Where are they going to go? Similarly, only shareholder control gives the neo caramel state an incentive to remain small and efficient. The totalitarian state has an incentive to become large and inefficient. And corporations don't, by the way, Logos. Remember how efficient Google is. And Facebook. No kidding. And Twitter. <laughs> no, no, Mulebug, you're an idiot. What did... Peter Thiel say, it's all about monopoly. You don't start a business unless you intend to become a monopoly. That's true. That's You could look it up on YouTube. That's what Peter Thiel said. Yeah. So there you go. Because every functionary has an incentive to expand his or her own, expand his or her own department and no bean counter who demands that the department do more with less. Well, what about corporations with the diversity quotas, Logos? Well, obviously, he yeah, he's 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 gonna say that's like the state imposing on corporations or something. But like, it's not. Here's the, it's not. Here's the problem. I don't see how this restructuring. Well, okay, he, <laughs> he wants to do with the university system as well. Like, here's the thing: we're looking at all these systems in isolation, right? He wants to do something with the university, and that's like one blog. Now he wants to restructure this into this neo capitalist system. That's another blog. But it turns out the way in which those systems feed back on each other is really important because if we become neo capitalist but the university is the same, you're still going to have all these like woke people being pumped out. They're going to like overinflate your, your administrations because it's going to be like the new fad to always like chase new DEI stuff and whatever. Um, so you have to do both simultaneously. And now you have to make the complex question, answer the complex question of like, how does a neo capitalist university system? work and, and unless you have a good answer th the result might end up being catastrophic well no it, it's it's simple logos i mean wokeism will just be the formerless neo camelist structure of mold bug could be it could end up being honestly yeah in a totalitarian state since no gangster is permanently safe from another gangster there's a strong incentive for anyone with power to take what he can while he can and there's no disincentive for him to avoid abusing a resource which neither he nor his allies benefit from under gangster management, the totalitarian state off, often engage not only in mass murder, but mass murder of the most economically productive citizens. It may seem odd that a two-party state would be so much better than a one-party state, but actually it makes a great deal of sense. Two-party or multipolarity states succeed because none of the parties can redirect state revenues openly to its own pocket. Whoa, logos! Whoa, whoa, That's an argument in favor of democracy there. Did you catch that? Say it again. Two-party or multi-party states succeed because none of the parties can redirect state revenue openly to its own pocket. Right. And so what's the argument in favor of democracies, right? We have these competing uh, platforms which allow for, uh, you know, better engagement with the uh, population and better solutions. Yep. They have an incentive to compromise, and they often compromise on something like a professional management. The result, although still afflicted by factional tension, may approach something like the rule of law. Unfortunately, two-party states have a number of paths by which they can degenerate into one-party states. For example, one party might use the power of government to marginalize and destroy its competitors. But this is by no means the only possible disaster. Perhaps the greatest danger is the party-like structures form in these civil service departments that are nominally nonpartisan. If you think of Western journalists as political party, for example, you notice that they fit the description quite well. Certainly their training is very much along the lines of cadre indoctrination. I'd argue that the entire polygon is essentially an embryonic one-party state, although in the United States, at least, it still has to be moderate in its attacks on the old political system. Nevertheless, the outlines of a post-partisan state are becoming clear, especially in Europe, and it's not neo-cameralist neo in the slightest. 
but it kind of is because you know the the the, the big money that's behind everything you know our our cokes our um teals and others they are trying to create this corporate monopoly structure that Moldbug is talking about. Yeah. I mean, they've said so. Oh, uh, perhaps the greatest danger is that a party like structure form in the civil service departments that are nominally nonpartisan. If you think of Western journalists as a political party, for example, you notice that they fit the description quite well. Certainly their training is very much long. I wrote that. Never mind. All this is easy to say. However, all of us grew up knowing that democracy is the best of all possible form systems of government. And it takes a large stack of reason, reasonable reasons before this deep fondness will even begin to buckle. So a large stack of reasonable reasons. More like a pile of nonsense. So let's, let me take another whack while the piñata is still swinging and attack the idea of political freedom. Political freedom is the freedom to engage in acts whose purpose is not direct satisfaction, but indirect satisfaction obtained by influencing government policy. When you vote, demonstrate, print underground leaflets, you are engaging in acts of political freedom. You do these things only because you believe they have some political effect. So what do you think about that? Uh, sounds like political freedom is going to persist even under neocameralism. We'll see what he says. <laughs> Personal freedom is the freedom to engage in all other acts that satisfy you directly and do not infringe the rights of others. For example, the other day I quoted Navrazov quoting Hobbes, who lists the following personal freedoms, to buy and sell and otherwise contract with one another, to choose their own abode, their own diet, their own trade of life, and institute their children as they themselves think fit and the like. Know that democracies tend to do a rather poor job of respecting these Hobbesian liberties. The only two that are customarily still respected are abode and trade of life, the universalist democracies, at least, do not assign their children housing or jobs. They massively obsess with the regulation of buying, selling, and contracting. They manage enormous programs of official education, and they are not without their dietary laws. Well, I mean, it's kind of odd for him to say this, right? Because within the United States, at least, there's still a profound amount of freedom for parents to raise their children. Um, you know, we have homeschooling as a legal as a legal practice in the United States, right? And that was. A, and a lot of the examples that people point to of extreme cases like, you know, polygamous cults in uh, Texas, obviously Waco, but also Mormons and other groups, they, 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 it wasn't primarily because they were educating their children in their, in the way that they thought fit. It was because for whatever reason, the state believed that they themselves presented a threat because there are plenty of people that educate children independent of state strictures. I, I mean, I've known plenty of them. Well, the other thing that's interesting to me as well is <clears throat> his libertarian bias is showing because buying and selling can actually impinge upon the rights of others and so on if the goods are both necessary for survival and scarce. Mm -hmm. Housing is a great example of this. If housing is too scarce an area where everybody wants to live, prices of housing can become so high that people just can't afford to live in that area, right? So political activism, let's say rent control, isn't yeah, it might change policy, but it's also uh, things involving your direct uh, – how do you word that? Your direct uh, bettering yourself or your direct – I don't know. Screw it. Um, uh, your – yeah. So the, the, the point is um, rent control issues, for example, might be your only way to get housing. If if the market's just just too hot where you live and you actually you know need housing to live, and so this this line that he's trying to set between political activism and you know personal economic transactions is actually very 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 blurry. And of course, Locke even talked about this: the idea that you know it's easy to let people homestead property as they like until all the property's gone or at risk of being gone to the point where you homesteading something means somebody else can't have it, and now your personal thing. Is now directly affecting somebody else, and now mm -hmm. your your clashing wants are going to become a political question. So, for example, uh, can people own five houses? If they have enough money, you might say yeah, but if there's a housing crisis, maybe not. Well, yeah, that's where you get Locke's proviso from, right? Exactly. Or, yeah, and he didn't even bring it up. He's just like, here's these two categories. Yeah. Never the two shall meet. Here's where democracy bad. It's like. Yeah, but the properties are really, really blended together. So what are you talking about? For people that love to quote Locke, they don't seem to have ever read what he said. 
Well, to be fair, I haven't read much Locke either, but I have read that part. It's important. So. Well, yeah, yeah, but you're not constantly quoting Locke. It's some oh, sort yeah, of like no. oracle, you know. Furthermore, there are some rather obvious candidates for the like in a modern society. For example, one might have freedom of medicine, absolute ownership of your own body, and the right to choose what experts help you maintain it, or what chemicals, devices, or procedures they may employ, or freedom of association, the absolute right to choose who you work and pay, play with, when and why, or freedom of finance, the absolute right to manage your own property and dispose of it as you see fit. If a neo cameral estate has any reason to infringe its customers' freedoms in any of these areas, I cannot imagine what it might be, whereas our democratic governments are constantly infringing them in almost every way imaginable for reasons that seem to be rooted simply in the production and maintenance of official employment. Okay, Logos, have at it. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he quotes Hobbes. He doesn't go far enough with Hobbes. It's very He can't think of a reason. Here it is. It's Hobbes. Um, let's suppose we take the freedom of association. Let's suppose a bunch of people take their freedom of association. There's a group of people that are just ex excluded. It could be based on skin color. It could be based on some of their characteristics, right? These people don't have enough property to make a business for themselves. They're poor. They're trying to get a job to get by. They're not getting a job to get by because people are choosing not to work with them, do their freedom of association, and so on. And so these people have two options, um, die of starvation or attempt to burn the system down. And what do they yeah. end up doing? They end up burning the system down. Now, oftentimes they're unsuccessful because they're minorities, but a lot of people get hurt and killed in the chaos. Or maybe, and sometimes they are actually successful. I think one example you brought up was like Haiti. Um, mm -hmm. So there you go. Like, like libertarians have this mental disorder where they just think of everything as atomized individual rights that never affect other people under any circumstances. Mm -hmm. And that's the most wrong-headed, stupid thing imaginable. Every individual thing you do on a planet with scarce resources and time will affect other people. Period. End of discussion. There's no getting around it. This, this isn't even up for debate. And so eventually, what you hold as rights are going to be in conflict that can only be resolved politically. Mm -hmm. Only. Ever. This isn't a property of democracy or monarchism or anything. Even a king is going to have to shake his head and deal... Take the, take the story of Solomon and the two women arguing about whose baby was whose, mm -hmm. right? People have the absolute right to raise their kids. It turns out people might might want the same kid for whatever reason. And kings have to arbitrate and figure out what the hell is going mm -hmm. on. None of this, none of this is solved by any system of government. This is just a product of basic scarcity. Yep. Of course, if you have the political freedom, you can use it to agitate for personal freedom. Thus, the Demotus Catechism goes, political freedom is actually the most important sort of freedom because if you have political freedom and enough people agree with you, you can get anything, including personal freedom. And if you can't convince the people, well, you're probably wrong in the first place. And political freedom can also get you other goodies, such as, for example, a share of this delicious revenue stream that the state is constantly producing or various benefits purchased with such. Or, or logos, maybe... Political freedom can help you get that house that that rich prick that bought five of took out of the market. Exactly. Maybe, maybe. just wild idea, you know? Wild idea. Wild idea. Perhaps I'm not representing the case of political freedom eloquently enough because these arguments strike me as very poor. If politics is good because you can use it to achieve personal freedom, this is not a case for politics over other methods which seem much more effective of producing personal freedom. You know, before I go on, last week we, we read him, you know, running down um, Dante. And, and I said this last time, and it strikes me even more the case today. This is clearly a, a, a person with a great deal of moral failings, resentful at a lot of people. Wait for it, actually a traitor, right? Because if he's a Brahmin, if he's if he's born with the blue bloods and now he's turning against them, just like Dante turned against the Florentines, um, by his own argument, he's Dante, and he's Dante in this very you know unflattering way. Like that's all it is. Mold, Moldbug is just mad that these people. We already saw that with the Matthew Iglesias uh, uh, essay a few episodes back, but he's not one of them. Yeah, I'm not going to speculate too much on his psychology. Just 
If politics is good because you can use it to achieve personal freedom, this is not a case for politics over other methods, which seem more effective of producing personal freedom. You know what the most effective way of producing personal freedom is? It turns out it's violence. <laughs> because you're either dead, in which case uh, there's no freedom to, to, to lament about because you're a corpse, or you, you succeed in, in getting the freedom that you're, you're really looking for. Politics is the compromise solution. It's, it's, it's what you have instead of violence. It's the chimps that Moldbug was talking about, the young yep. chimp or the old chimp, right? The rich dude getting five houses on the market that's in the middle of a housing crisis. He's either the old chimp, and he's about to get deposed violently or politically, or he's the young chimp and he wins. But certain people are going to be desperate enough to roll those dice and figure it out. Mm -hmm. But no, Logos, Logos, we're all going to pursue our rational self-interest with cool calculating uh, decision-making. We can. If I want a place to live, I can't afford anywhere because people keep buying up five houses. Mm -hmm. I don't have the means to move or do anything else, and I'm kind of stuck. And so I'm, in, I'm literally in a get housing by desperate means or die situation. What's my rational self-interest? Well, it's get housing by any means or die trying because that's kind of the environment that's been foisted on me. Mm -hmm. We're done. Mm -hmm. And the use of politics to benefit yourself is simply lawless extortion. Here we see the essentially paramilitary nature of democracy. When you use power to monopolize some scarce resource in the absence of law that assigns an owner to that resource, you are inevitably struggling against others who will use power themselves. This may be extremely limited war, but it is a war nonetheless. Well, no, well, you know inevitable. Well, well, not only that, you know what lawless extortion is? Is creating a class of wage slaves that can't leave. Right. Well, I mean, I mean, also, lawless extortion just depends on who writes the laws. I mean, if, yeah. you, if you get things changed politically so that your extortion's lawful, it's by definition no longer lawful, lawless. What the hell is he talking about? I have no idea, Logos. No idea. On the border between personal and political freedom are freedoms such as freedom of the press, which can be defined as personal freedoms, but which as such affect relatively few people in a relatively minor way. Not many people are intellectuals who like to write for the public. There are probably more windsurfers, for example, in the world. Banning windsurfing would be a personal cost to those who like to windsurf, but not so much to anyone else. Of course, infringing the freedom of the press harms the freedom of those who like to read. A much larger, larger group, it's still, if still hardly the majority. But suppose the freedom of the press is infringed only on political subjects or trivial subjects. For example, suppose it's illegal to insult the king as it is in Thailand. Well, you know what, Logos? I got this crazy idea. What if it's not the government that suppresses the freedom of speech, but the corporations? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, I'm sure that would never happen, Logos. Never. Never. When I compare freedom of medicine, for example, to freedom of political publishing, I can't help but feel that the former is much more important. Am I crazy? Perhaps I am crazy. If so, perhaps someone will write in and tell me. The issue arises, you see, because of the existence of a vaguely quasi neo criminal state such as Singapore and Dubai. I linked earlier to this discussion on a very orthodox universalist blog, Unfogged. Of Singapore, it is interesting how universalists can maintain their convictions while living in a place whose very existence contradicts them. The contradiction becomes just another proof of faith. Yet another of Astor's unprincipled exception, I suppose. Now, th this, this actually sums up Moldbug and libertarianism very well. The contradiction just becomes another proof of faith. So when the corporation deplatforms you, right? So Keith Woods recently pointed out that Stefan Malin, who spent his entire life saying the corporations can do whatever they want, and they kicked him off YouTube. Well, that's just proof that the state is too involved in this whole process, Logos. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> it's it's true. I mean, I mean, how do we solve that one, Logos? I don't know. I'm not even gonna try to speculate. Singapore and Dubai are not neo Camerlos paradises. They are certainly very well managed in most senses, but they are also extremely conscious of living in a political world. Singapore, in particular, emerged only out of a very nasty post-colonial street politics. The ruling party is still called the People's Action Party. I really cannot think of a more terrifying name. Well, of course you can't. Look. Of course you can't, Moldbug, of course. Well, actually he can, right? Um, it would be Mustache Man's party. <laughs> but we'll leave that aside for now. And so Singapore in particular works very hard and very famously to suppress politics and political freedom. My understanding, perhaps somewhat 
someone can correct me, is that almost everyone in Singapore has no interest at all in anti-government politics, that people really are generally happy to simply think about their own lives. But for a Singaporean to be involved in anti-government politics has roughly the same result that involvement in racist or extremist politics has for an American. It's simply politically incorrect in Singapore to say bad things about the government much as it's politically incorrect here to say very to say bad things about protected minorities, at least as a social faux pas, at most it might cost you your job. Well, but see, this is this is really the whole point, the whole point of freedom of speech, right, Logos? The whole point of freedom of speech, as defined in the 18th and 19th centuries, was to be able to publicly criticize your government without the fear of being sent to prison so that you could course correct uh, bad decisions that the monarchs were making, for example, uh, and save your country from a catastrophe without going to jail. Right. Somehow Moldbug missed that bit. I find it difficult, of course, to erode, endorse political correctness. This is because I'm an intellectual and I have trouble keeping my mouth shut. I have enough trouble with the American version of the doctrine. But I agree with Hobbes on one thing. A government is not a government unless it takes the necessary steps to preserve itself. It is not physically feasible to arrest and prosecute every soldier of an invading army. The same applies for domestic militant movements as well. A state that does not have the power to ban political organizations is leaving itself open to linked political military movements such as Sinn Féin and the IRA, an open invitation for every political party to grow a paramilitary wing. In Weimar, Germany, even the Social Democrats had their equivalent of the SA. If we regard suspension of political freedom in this light, Singapore is simply protecting itself from the ravages of democracy, which have certainly afflicted it in recent memory. Well, hold on, Logos. Hold on a second. Singapore is a democracy, according to Moldbug, because it's the modest. It's called the People's Action Party, which means that the people are sovereign. What the heck are we talking about here? I don't know, man. Like, I've lost a plot a few minutes ago. Like, the arguments just keep getting worse. It's hard to follow the People's Action Party for this, but I wish there was a better modern example of Bismarck's dictum with regard to the press. They say what they want, I do what I want. My In my neo in my ideal neo Camerala state, there's no political freedom because there is no politics. Wow, so all, all of life is just economic calculation. That's, that's it's also wrong, because shareholders have to plan for the future of a, of a, of a company, right? Mm -hmm. Even even under a corporate model, you still have politicking on a board of share. Has he never observed a board of shareholders? The board of shareholders have to vote. Mm -hmm. And people, PACs, organizations, think tanks, all of whom would put pressures on the shareholders to try to get their way. I mean, even King Solomon had to deal with politics. Again, the two women arguing over whose baby was mm -hmm. whose was a perfect example of Solomon having to make a political decision. And then also there were men plotting to overthrow him. Exactly. I mean, th think about this, right? You have hostile takeovers. You have different, different like factions within a board arguing over like which company should do what. I mean, it's not like any of this goes away if you just call call this thing a corporate structure instead of a congress. Like you still have all the usual th because you're still dealing with future uncertainty, right? It just occurred to me here. Here's here's a core problem of of mold bug, right? He says that uncertainty and friction is the cause of all violence. Well, there's nothing more uncertain than the future, period. And so as long as you have future uncertainty, you have politics of how to deal with problems in the present to thwart various things that could happen in the future. And as long as you've got this, this, this friction between problems in the present and how solutions will affect the future, you're going to have the need for politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you still have the Lockean proviso dilemma. In just one case, exactly. Perhaps the government has a comment box where you can express your opinion. Perhaps it does customer surveys and even polls. But there's no organization and no reason to organize because no combination of residents can influence government policy by coercion. <laughs> good luck with that, huh, Legos? I'm sure the I mean, czar uh, thought the same thing. I mean, good luck with that because where's the people going to go? Again, the entire corporate model is predicated on the fact that if you don't like what the government's doing, you vote with your feet. So you have to have a universal globalist system by which people can move to countries that fit them best in order for any of this to work. Because, look, if the, mm -hmm. if the citizens can't change government policy that's hurting them, there's no way to politically affect change, and they've got nowhere to go to escape the bad policies, then the only way the citizens can do anything is pure violence. That's just how you get political revolutions. So what the hell is he aiming at? What the 
I, I'm about to curse obscenities. What is his point? I, I don't know. And precisely because of this stability, you can think, say, or write whatever you want because the state has no reason to care. Your freedom of thought, speech, and expression is longer political freedom. It's only a personal freedom. All right, whatever, Logos. Uh, just a few relevant notes here at the end. Although Molbug rejects the label monarchist, this is principally because in this modern meeting, which typically refers to a supporter of a constitutional monarchy. In From Mises to Carlisle, well, it must be future? Have we gotten here yet? Oh, that's way later. So he's come back and edited this. From Mises to Carlisle, Molbug describes himself as a royalist, which essentially means a supporter of an absolute or divine right monarchy. See, divine right monarchy for the modern secular intellectual and the patchwork of political system for the 21st century. Yeah, it's this kind of stuff, for more information, that got us into the dark enlightenment, which right. is total nonsense. I mean, the Stuarts lost the Civil War, guys. Done. Like, I don't know why we have this conversation. Yep. Moldbug later revised his post on mercantilism, as he put it, in Sam Altman is not a blithering idiot. But really, I am a mercantilist. Wow. Okay. And everything I know about economics is learned by, by reading Friedrich List. Well, him and Mises. But List and Mises are like polar opposites. List says that the people shouldn't be traveling around, but should stay in the country. And that there should be high tariffs to protect domestic production. <laughs> that's, that's the opposite of Mises. Yeah. Odd bedfellows, I know. But I really believe there's nothing in, to use its old name, political economy, which is outside the philosophy of these two fine Teutonic gentlemen opposite so they were right logos because mises was so teutonic cough cough i don't even know what that means teutonic is an old name for german oh okay got it but um okay wow okay yeah we'll we'll just we'll just stop here uh we're gonna look at the comments for a little bit and then give everybody some time to enjoy the rest of the day and the rest of the weekend since this is people's holiday weekend Yep. Ty Byrne will enjoy another episode of The Sea. <laughs> Last part of the Mold Bug Matrix is particularly irritating, what with his assumptions about Rhodesia and British politics, which were no different to the cathedrals. Yeah. <laughs> How much to say about that? Do you have anything to say to that, Logos? No. And uh, evidence violates community guidelines. Hello. Found praise of folly through endeavor. Looking forward to this live stream. Well, thanks for coming on board. Mm. Tyburn. Universalism was actually great. Ice cold take, even for 2007. Wow. <laughs> uh, let's see. <laughs> Here, you like this one, Logos. Uh, hashtag Bolshevik baboons. Mm -hmm. Ah. <laughs> uh. Here, this is to your point, Logos, about World War One. Evidence violates community guidelines. France and Germany both had designs to charge through Belgium, but surprised the French were late. The Germans were timely, and all war responsibility got pinned on Germany. Interesting. <laughs> Fat Elvis Jr. Did he fall into Todd's tr set up there? Todd seems very pleased. I think that was right. He made the, the argument in favor of representative government mm -hmm. unintentionally. Uh, Mac Damon, we measure the Eastern Bloc in terms of reductive reasoning, but we measure the modern West in terms of cortisol and balance. A neighborhood has a cortisol rising. Uh, do you know what that means, Logos? Um, I think, I think, isn't cortisol one of the, the hormones associated with uh, motherhood, especially? Um, oh, it might be. And so it, it might be, um, I, I think he's making a tongue-in-cheek comment about how politics for women can change before and after they have kids. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, ha. Libertarians are, well, not wrong, right, Logos? <laughs> I wouldn't even call them allies. Like, Well, they're yeah, they're never allies at all. Um, no. No. They're, 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 they're people who have a lot to say. They're just waiting to stab you in the back for the corporate daddy. Yep. Brian Thompson, Solomon had to confront a Jerry Springer situation. Yeah, I saw that and got a chuckle. Brian <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thompson, attacks ideas as utopian, but that expresses his own unworkable utopian vision. 
but but you see, Ryan, if only we had the ring of Fenargle. Um, yeah, if only we had a sci-fi trope. Yeah. Teutonic West German, the left commies bankers. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Uh, <clears throat> uh, for, for anybody who wants to know what the real group's name is, look at the uh, thumbnail. Uh, okay, Jerry Springer. Oh, uh, here we go. We'll end with this logo, Libertarians by Ryan Thompson. That That is the one word to sum up this entire stream today. Yes. Uh, that's it. We, we, you know, we'll just give it to Ryan Thompson. This whole today can just be summed up in one word. Lola There's your Tim. TLDR, everybody. TLDR, guys. That's it. Go home. You know, enjoy your holidays. Time off from work. Uh, thanks again, Logos, for uh, showing up. This is Todd Lewis of the Praise of Folly podcast signing off.